Hello, welcome to another episode of Tim's Love of Garden. Okay, so this is what the uh, courgette plants look like at the moment. As you can see, the leaves are going slightly yellow. Now, this is a this is a sign of either a lack of nitrogen or uh, magnesium. So, for nitrogen, um, basically, I've put loads of grass in here, so I'm pretty sure it's not nitrogen. But uh, these are coffee grounds come from Starbucks. Um, this is just like the used coffee. And what you can do is just sprinkle a few of those around the bottom and that will enhance the nitrogen levels in the ground but it's more likely to be magnesium now if you, if you can get some Epsom salts like this um, this, this is sold at most chemists um, and all you need is a teaspoon of that in a watering can water that onto the plants and uh, you'll start to see the plants to recover Now as you can see the kale that uh, Richard Sydenham sent me is uh, doing really well. It's almost as good as the rhubarb to so These leaves are absolutely massive and you can see compared to the size of my hand how big these leaves are. Um, but the one thing uh, you need to do most certainly this time of year with plants like this is um, tie them up. Now these, these Scottish kale plants at the front, um, I've not put any stakes in those yet but uh, I may well put some stakes in there but the, the brew kale at the back um, what I'm going to do is uh, most certainly expect those to grow up beyond these sticks here so they're going to get top heavy um, as you can see this one here is kind of flopped over now all I'm going to do is basically get some string um, like I've done with this one here um, go around the plant twice uh, you can see that but I've gone around the plant twice and then round the stick and what that will do is um, stop the plant from becoming um, you know sort of waving about in the wind and uh, damaging the bottom of the plant Okay, so as you can see, the chard has, um, you know, sort of really, um, really started to grow now. So this can potentially go out very um, shortly. And this is the um, the swede plants that I put in. Now I did put a row of swede in, but unfortunately, some beetle went through and um, ate them all. So what I'm going to do is basically go back up the row with these and bob these in. I'll put a little clip of me doing that. Um, hopefully later on today but um, so as you can see these are doing really well so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put a second batch of, um, of um, 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 broccoli in because last year I managed to get two crops of broccoli um, and the because the um, the uh, the tunnel down the bottom of the lot not this one you can see but the one behind it um, the peas haven't done very well so what I'm going to do is cut my losses dig all that out and then what I'm going to do is um, even if the the first lot of um, broccoli hasn't finished by the time these are ready to go in. I can always put them in at the bottom and then um, you know, I can have a second batch. Because the things with broccoli is it's a really nice vegetable, but it all tends to come within sort of two or three weeks. So if I put a second batch in, I will then get a second crop a little bit later in the year. So I'll just do that now. Okay, so this is no different to the way I've done the other brassicas earlier in the year. But basically all I've got is a tray here. This is some of the, uh, the clover um, compost. Now... This, at this time of the year, this is, this is when you can be putting all the crops in um, to eat later on. Because the problem is with gardening, particularly people who are just starting out, is they put loads of stuff in the garden and then they crop it all and then, you know, they've got, you know, it's all kind of over in a flash. But if you can, if you can um, sort of put various things in um, sort of later in the year, then what you can do is you can actually increase your sort of harvesting season, if you like. So... Most certainly brassicas will grow through cold winter um, weather and uh, you know they will you know most certainly survive most weathers in the UK so brassicas are most certainly one that you can go for. Obviously um, Japanese onions are another one so you know you can put other onions in 
um, so you can have basically two crops of onions and also you can you know you can grow stuff in cold frames and that and all and all of these things will actually extend your um, you know you you know your sort of growing season but um, these are the um, these are from the um, dairy um, group now I've, I've got these from um, um, a shop over in uh, the Black Country. I um, can't remember the name of it now, but um, the, the, you know these seeds um, have done really well so far. These are the ones that I've got growing um, down the bottom, and this is um, this is basically classed as um, autumn calabrese. And to be honest with you, you know they will they will um, you know sort of grow. You know, obviously it depends on when you put them in and how they grow in the garden. Um, they will. Um, sort of crop at any time really even though this is classed as autumn they will um, you know sort of actually start to um, sort of develop the um, the florets or the little the, the sort of the flower heads the bit that you eat um, actually earlier on if you get them in early enough so um, you know within I think it's uh, I think there's typically like a 12 12 to 16 week growing season on these so if you can get them in um, if I can count forward from now um, you know they will um, you know they will um, you, you know, sort of come. You know, you can start harvesting them within twelve to sixteen weeks. Now, it says on the packet. Um, I don't know if you can see that, but you harvest it between August and September. So I could potentially be harvesting the first batch that I put in um, in August, which is only sort of four weeks away, um, four or five weeks away. And then, um, you know, you, you know, these ones could potentially be, um, you know, sort of harvested in, in, in October. I know it says September on there, but. Uh, you know you can sort of stretch it out a little bit so all I've done is just sprinkle those seeds on the ground and all brassicas are like these small um, small little uh, just get a seed out I didn't show you did I? they're like small um, little um, sort of grey black brown balls they're all pretty much the same and they all you know all all brassicas look the same when they come up um, they'll all look very much like this these are Swede which are also a brassica but they'll all pretty much look like these as they're starting to come up. So um, all you need to do now is just with a little bit of compost, um, you know, you don't need to bury these very much, just sprinkle some compost over the top. And that's why with, with brassicas most certainly um, fine compost, uh, compost does work a lot better because um, you don't want to bury them too deep, you only want to bury them um, with just a you know, couple of millimetres of um, soil really. You know they they are quite forgiving, but the one thing that you must do with um, brassicas is as soon as you've got them in like that, just just make sure that the ground's nice and nice and level. Is is um, firm them in because brassicas do like firm ground. So get yourself a block of wood or, or or anything like that, and then just push down like that. And what that will do is it will it will um, firm the soil down, but it'll also make sure that the seed is in contact with the with the compost which is quite important because you want the seed to stay moist and obviously the compost is what's going to be holding the moisture. Now I'm going to water these with tap water just like all the rest um, you know you know what you don't want to do is water these from rainwater because there's potentially algae and things in there which will, which will cause you problems. Obviously put a label in so what I'll do is I'll get a label sorted out I've probably got one with um, with broccoli already written on it too much somewhere but um, what I'll do is I'll put a label in here. No need for any glass or anything like that at this time of year. You know these will grow quite happily. Leave these in the greenhouse, and in a couple of weeks' time they'll be growing up, and I'll be uh, able to put these out probably in about three weeks' time. A quick tip when you're watering your um, tomatoes. Always try to water the base of the plants. Don't uh, don't get the the foliage wet, uh, which is sometimes easier said than done when the when the um, you know when you've got quite a lot of leaves. But if you can minimise the amount of moisture going onto the leaves, um, that will minimise your chance of getting um, you know sort of fungal diseases such as blight on the tomatoes. So I just want to go through some of the comments and questions that we've had come over in the past couple of weeks. Um, the first one comes from uh, Me Loves Coffee and it was all about how um, they'd started to dig out the uh, the Charlotte potatoes and the carrots and the peas that they're starting to harvest off their garden. And it was just a comment that really rang true for me because there's nothing more satisfying than growing your own vegetables and, and then digging out the, um, 
digging out the vegetables and the carrots and the you know and the peas and everything like that and uh, you know and just sort of enjoying them and I think there's nothing better than you, you know not only the fact that they they, they taste so much better um, than you know than in the shops and you know full well that there's been nothing you know there's no you know there's been no pesticides or, or, or any sort of anything like that nasty on them and you know it's really good quality food and it just tastes that so much better when you've grown it yourself um, and that that was a really nice comment thank you for that the next one comes from Pro Bodger and um, it was a comment about the uh, the gravel trays now I had a, um, a question a couple of weeks ago about when I did the when I did the field tour and um, there's quite a few people here that have got these cages that are used on the side of motorways and um, in sort of sort of landscaping where what you do is you get a um, it's like a galvanized steel wire um, cage and what you actually do is you put the cage in and then you fill it full of rocks um, and it's to basically reinforce um, you know sort of embankments and stuff like that but they are really useful in the allotment because what you can do is basically take the top off them turn them over and use them as a cage to stop pigeons and I, I don't know sort of any of the critters getting onto your um, vegetables and uh, they're actually called, I didn't realize until I had this comment from Pro Bodger but the they're actually called um, Gabion baskets so if you go onto the internet and search for Gabion G A B I O N baskets um, there's actually quite a few companies out there that actually sell them so I was quite surprised that they were quite easy to find so that's what they're called um, so if you you know you know if you do want any and you haven't got any other um, sort of mesh to make them from. I mean, they are reasonably easy to make. To be honest, they're high, I have made some in the past, a um, few years back, and all I used was some. I used to keep uh, rabbits in the garden, and so I I bought some basically some mesh, um, some you know sort of quite coarse sheets of you know sort of galvanised metal um, steel mesh, and uh, if you can get sort of um, some of that, you can quite easily put them together yourself. Just cable tie them together and make a cage. But um, if you want to buy them ready-made, um, as I say, just search for um, Gabby and Baskets, and um, you know that will, you, you know, they most certainly will be available. Not quite sure what the cheapest way of doing it would be. Um, I, I'm quite lucky at the minute because I've got a few sheets of it because I took um, took a load of um, Harris fencing panels apart to make the tunnel um, earlier this year. So I've got some, you know, sort of 10 foot long or so 11 foot long by by sort of six foot sheets of it so you know I could I could potentially make quite a few of them but uh, I mean that's another way of doing it getting a Harrison fence panel and taking the, the mesh out of it so there, there are quite a few different ways you could actually do this I'm not quite sure which is the cheapest um, but you can get um, Harrison fence panels for um, Harris fence panels should I say for um, you know sort of damaged ones for sort of five pound or something um, you can actually see them on eBay being um, sold um, so uh, you know that, that's that's quite possible. You know, with one of them, you could possibly make sort of two out of that. Depends on what size you need. Uh, the next one comes from um, Richard Sydenham, and he was saying um, about the kale. Um, I put a few comments on about the kale last week. Um, how, it, how, how well it's growing, and I'm, I'm really pleased with the uh, the brew, um, the, um, the the Scottish kale, um, and also the. Um, uh, petrage kale they are growing really well and they're, they're, they're really liking the soil conditions and um, Richard was saying that he's actually sowing his kale now because uh, what he'll do is when he digs his potatoes out he'll plant his kale where his potatoes were and then what he'll do is actually get two crops out of one piece of land so what he'll do is dig his potatoes out so they've been growing from kind of March uh, up until now dig them potatoes out and then what he'll do is then put the kale in that same ground grow the kale on and then he'll harvest that next March or April let it grow through the winter and then he'll have a, a, an early crop next year um, of, of kale then he can put his potatoes back in potentially again so you know you get two crops out of one piece of land so I thought that was a really good comment to, um, to let everybody know so he's actually sowing kale now um, the next one comes from um, Brian Hubbery and he was saying about um, the fuchsia cutters that I took last week. Now they're doing quite well. Um, I've not. Um, I've only watered them once since because we've had reasonably cool weather. But as you can see, you know, there's no signs of them, you know, sort of withering or anything like that. So I think uh, we're going to have some success with these. Now fuchsia cuttings aren't difficult to take, to be honest with you. So so do have a go. If you if you if you know anybody that's got a fuchsia that you can pinch a few cuttings off, you can very quickly um, sort of propagate. Or, or even if you've got some. Um, Fuchsia yourself, you know this is this is um, a good time. Any time from well, as soon as they start shooting, really, up until now, you can take cuttings. I'm a little bit late, but um, 
they're actually hardy fuchsias, so I've actually taken them a little bit later. I wanted the plants to establish themselves, and, and by by taking cuttings now, you also encourage the, the mother plant to bush out, so that's that's gone a while, I've waited till now. But typically, fuchsia cuttings are taken in sort of April, April, May time, that's that's you know more typical time to take them. Um, most certainly if you grow them in the greenhouse, like I used to do, you know, the more, um, um, the less sort of frost resistant varieties, um, you know, they typically grow a lot quicker because you've got them in the greenhouse. Um, so they're ready to take cuttings a lot sooner, so you, you know, the, you know, potentially plants outside. But um, the two, the two tips that um, that um, Brian, well, actually three, um, he said um, to to um, to stop them drying out too much. What you can do is put the uh, um, a plastic propagating lid over them, and that will help to hold the moisture in. So you know, you know it'll keep the atmosphere moisture in there. Um, I've, I've, I've never actually done that myself. What I have done in the past is um, on some of the more difficult um, varieties to, to you know to root. I, I know um, I've had problems with rufous and fulgens in the past. Um, they're not particularly easy um, ones to root. I've found, um, and also um, there was a there, there was another one. Um, Annabelle is another variety that I found difficult to strike, or, or not difficult, but not as easy as others. Um, there are some varieties like um, Eva Borg and uh, Tennessee Walls. They just you throw them on the ground and they strike. So, you know they're uh, you know they're really easy to grow. But um, what I have done in the past is put a plastic bag over the top, and um, that's kind of kept the environment in there a little bit better, and they have rooted. What you need to do is if you is if you do do that, get a get a pencil or a pen or a stick or anything, and then if you've got the if you've got the future cutting in a pot, just put a just put a pen in like that or a stick or whatever um, and then put the bag over and then just just don't don't sort of tie it round you need some airflow in there but so just put a plastic bag over and what the stick or the pen or whatever will do is it'll stop the plastic bag from touching the leaves of the cutting which will potentially damage it if it, if, you know if it gets too too kind of warm in there so uh, you know if you do put a bag over always put a stick or something in there just to hold the bag away from the actual plant itself and uh, you know you won't have any problems um, the other comment was um, what he has tried in the past as well is to, is to get just a normal sheet of newspaper, so you know just some paper, and then wrap it round the, um, the the tray where you put your cuttings, and that will also a reduce the amount of light, um, and then it'll also keep the keep the environment around the cuttings a little bit moister, so that'll um, that'll. Uh, um, you, you know, sort of help to um, get them to root. Now, the one thing you need to be careful of is you, you do want some airflow in there because you can get sort of fungus and stuff like that. And if that starts to form on the um, the cuttings, it can cause them to you know rot, and then obviously they won't they, they won't grow. So you do want some airflow in there. So if you do put a bag over or anything like that or a propagator, always make sure that you know the the environment in there isn't too wet because that's when you start you know that's when you'll start to get fungus forming in there. And uh, the next comment, um, which is a really good one, and he is right. Um, if you're growing standard fuchsias, um, I've, I've grown quite a few standard fuchsias in the past. It typically takes about two years to do it. But what you do is you have a single um, cutting, like a single shoot. And what you do is you take all the side shoots out, much like you do with um, tomatoes. So you take out all the side shoots coming out. So you've just got one stalk, um, you know, the main kind of trunk of the plant, if you like. And then you wait till it grows to, I don't know, it, it, it depends what you want to do. A, um, um, a full size standard is typically about five foot high, um, or you can get half standards, which are kind of, I don't know, two and a half, three foot high. Um, and then what you do is you, you let it grow up to the top, and then you um, basically grow like a, a ball on the top of it. So you let it, as soon as it gets to the height you want it, uh, what you do then is you allow the side shoots to form, you take the top out, and then the side shoots will start to form and then you form like a ball on the top and then the next year what you'll get is that um, sort of branches cascading down full of flowers and they are really beautiful to uh, to look at sponge they are really nice so they're a, like a centerpiece type plant the problem is with standards is um, fuchsias will go into hibernation at, um, during the winter and what happens is the sap will 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 come out of the uh, the plant and, and, and go into the you know kind of the roots if you like so with standards, if you want to overwinter them, what you most certainly need to do, and standards won't withstand a winter in, in, in Britain, irrespective of what the variety is, but what you need to do is take them inside and lie them on the side, and what that actually does is it keeps the sap, or some sap, actually in the stalk, and so when you, um, 
when you come to the following year you can put them back up upright and they will start to shoot from the top. What I have found in the past is um, if you don't lie them down, even if you do lie them down this sometimes happens, but what you'll get is the plant will send um, new shoots out from the bottom but the main stem that's taken you a year to grow has actually died off so that's like sort of old wood. So if you are going to grow standards which is where you grow a single shoot up you need to put a cane in a single shoot up and then it gets to I don't know two and a half three foot five foot however big you want to do it um, most certainly in the UK if you want a five foot one you, you you will basically grow the trunk of it the first year the second year you'll grow the top and then the third year that's when it comes into sort of fruition where you're actually going to get flowers and all the rest of it on if you have um, if you have like a half standard which is kind of sort of two and a half three foot high um, you can normally get the, the stem and the ball at the top formed in the first year, then the second year it will flower. Um, you know, most certainly in the winter you need to keep them frost free and you need to keep them, um, you know, sort of put them on the sides during the winter and then, you know, you'll, you'll, you will get growth at the top the following year as opposed to just shooting from the bottom. Okay, so it's at this time of year where you need to start um, thinking about potting any house plants up really that have got pot bound or in fact they've got like this. Now these are aloe vera plants. These these plants are every house should in, in my opinion every house should have at least one of these. Now aloe vera is not only a nice plant to look at uh, but it also has got numerous medical um, properties. Now if you if you're unlucky enough to burn your hand um, if you this is this is uh, this is like part of the um, part of the leaf structure. If you break that off or cut it off what you get is this um, sort of sort of sap. It doesn't look particularly nice to look at but uh, if you put that on a burn it will most certainly um, stop the burning and it will protect the um, uh, protect the skin. Now this this sort of gel that's in there uh, you know you can squeeze it out of the uh, the leaf like that um, and this this has got um, a whole manner of properties. It's it's um, antiseptic. It's also um, you know stops any kind of infection, but it also is very moisturising, and it will um, you know sort of most you know most certainly protect any cuts or anything that you've got on your hands. So all you need to do is rub some of that on there, um, and, and what that will do is it'll stop the burning, and it'll also um, you know make sure that the skin is um, sort of clean and you know sort of free of any sort of bacteria or anything like that. So. But unfortunately, um, if your if yours are anything like mine, you know they just get completely pot bound, and you get all these kind of babies growing on the side. These these sort of young shoots that have formed from the back, and this is part of the the sort of the succulent family. So uh, they do tend to grow from the uh, the bottom. They send out shoots and they grow up like this. Um, and the the mother plant, this one here, is typically gets too big for the pot. And um, as I'm growing these in my um, kitchen window, I don't want them to get kind of this big because they just get unruly. And basically, you, you could potentially pot this up, um, this this sort of this larger part here, into a bigger pot. But um, it, it wouldn't be uh, the the pot would be just too big for a windowsill. So I always like to take the small ones um, like this and then discard the large one uh, when it gets to kind of this stage. So the best way to um, to separate these is basically just to turn the pot on its side like that and then just push through through the hole at the bottom and if you look on here what you'll get is the um, the sort of the roots in there now the soil that you want for these um, these these plants being um, from the sort of the succulent group of plants um, which is similar to cactuses really you know they don't need a lot of nutrition at all um, from the soil you know they, they they get most of the nutrition that they need either from the air or from the, the basically the water that you give them so um, you know, basically the soil is there to anchor the plant down. That's the that's the most important thing. So what you need is a um, sort of um, compost sand mix. As you can see, this is quite sandy, um, and they'll be really happy in there. Basically, these these are a little bit top heavy. So what you need to do is anchor the bottom of them so that they stay in place. That's the that's the main purpose of the soil. But um, obviously, if you do put some sort of composting like I do, you will get these babies coming every year, these these sort of side shoots, and then you can pot these on. Now, the majority of these, to be honest with you, are going to go to charity. Um, they're going to be sold off and uh, to raise money for the dog's home. But basically what you need to do is just very gently 
tease these apart like this and then you can see you'll get these sort of young plants that you can pot on so I'm just going to pull all of these away like that now that's the that's the main plant you could potentially pot that on um, but um, as I say it's going to be a bit big and this is probably about three or four years old now so um, that for me is a little bit past it to be honest with you but it'll it'll still service as a you know a, a pretty good plant um, but what I'm going to focus on are these these kind of small ones so to repot up what I've got in here is um, I've got some sharp sand I don't know if you can see but I've got some sharp sand in there which is this here uh, which is um, clean sharp sand and I've also got some of the um, clover compost um, in there now this is this is about kind of 50 50 mix so all I'm going to do is just mix this together with my hand block that's in the book it's just basically just just mix it all together and the sand the sand will 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 basically do two things for you one it'll improve the drainage because what you don't want is these plants to be sitting in moisture too much um, and also what it will do is it'll it'll make the make the uh, the compost heavier which will act as a better anchor for the uh, the aloe vera plant so you can't really see what I'm doing but it's a little bit difficult on here so I'm just mixing that up I'll have to mix the bottom but there's still a bit quite a bit of compost at the bottom but you're looking for a kind of 50 50 mix like that of compost and sand so I'll just put this on the floor two seconds I'll just quickly put this a quick mix up Okay, that's pretty mixed up now. So uh, I'll just put this on one side so I can go it. So the first thing I'm going to do is select the best plant to keep myself. So I've um, so I've got some for next year. So I'll just get the pot again. So obviously, if you're keeping it for yourself, then um, I would I would most certainly recommend a um, pottery pot. I'm not going to wash this, but ideally you would wash it. Um, these are some broken crocks. I'm just going to put because the hole's quite big at the bottom here. So what I'm going to do is just cover the cover the hole with some crocs. This is just a broken pot basically. Always always keep those because they're always useful to put at the bottom. And what I'm going to do is just put a just put a handful of um, uh, compost at the bottom there just to hold those crocs in place. Now what I'm going to do is select select the biggest one because this is most certainly going to be the biggest pot. So this one this one here is probably the biggest plant. If there's any kind of leaves like this that are dried off, then pull them away. Uh, this one's a little bit damaged, so I'll just pull that back like that. And and the plant is quite robust. You know, you can sort of pull the leaves off. Don't don't be too uh, sort of scared of doing that. Now, put the put the sort of arrange the roots at the bottom of the uh, the pot like that, and just hold the hold the plant in place like that. Whilst you're doing that, what you want to do is make sure that all of these roots um, get covered with. Uh, your compost sand mix again, just just sort of put the plant up and down like that make sure that it's nice and in there and what you want to do is anchor the plant in and make sure it's nice and firm like that, you can go slightly deeper than it was previously um, I'm just going to put a little bit more on there but as I say you know you don't need a lot of nutrition in the um, in the compost here um, you know you could you could potentially plant these in just gravel to be honest with you like you do with orchids and things like that um, but uh, just make sure you've got plenty in like that you've probably got enough there and then make sure it's nice and firm so what you're actually doing by that is a you're anchoring the plant in but also you're making sure that all of the roots of the plant are in contact with the compost so it can draw the moisture out that's important these are quite sappy plants so water to them is quite important and then just to anchor it a little bit better what I'm going to do is put a handful of um, shale or gravel now this is this is washed this is relatively cheap to buy this is just um, pea gravel you can get this from most garden centers and hardware stores um, and this just this just three things really the first thing is it, it makes it look a bit better um, you know it, it looks nicer but also more importantly what it actually does is it, it, it helps even further to anchor the plant down and it stops the moisture sitting around the base of the plant so what it'll do is the moisture will go straight when you water these the moisture will go straight through and into the pot and then um, you know it'll it'll go to the root but what this will actually do is it'll it'll just stop the evaporation from the top so the moisture will stay in the bottom um, it'll keep the moisture from actually touching the plant and um, this the, the weight of the gravel will actually hang the plant in there really well so that 
that plant, there's, there's, there's a couple of scar bits here where people are taking bits off where they've been burnt, but that's essentially the way to do it. Um, so what I'll do now is just pot some of the others up in a smaller, um, smaller pots to be given away for charity. Now, obviously, clean water, um, and these plants will, will grow really well inside. These are most certainly inside plants in the UK. So give it a, a reasonably good water like that, just to settle the ground in there. And then what I do suggest is, is underneath you put a tray, like a, a, a small pot underneath to hold the water there. And what I will typically do is water these from the bottom when they're in the house. So that's the first one done. The rest of them I'm going to put in small square pots. Uh, the reason being um, is they'll, they'll basically um, sell best in those. So these are, these are some um, square pots that uh, I actually got the, um, the cucumber plants in from the shops this year. So I've got a number of square pots. These aren't the ones that these are the ones that I get from um, Wilco's. These are the ones I use for the for the plants. These ones are a little bit different. They're a little bit more robust. So these will be ideal to sell the uh, sell them in for the charity. So again, just put a uh, a bit of um, compost in at the bottom like this because the holes are reasonably small in the bottom of these. There's no need for crocs really. That, that they'll be perfectly okay. Again. Select your plant and just just tease them apart like this. Don't don't uh, you don't want any damage on the roots, um, you know, uh, or at least as much as possible. Pull off any leaves at the bottom that are potentially damaged or anything like that. So you can pull these away like that. Just pull them off sort of sideways like that, and then holding the plant like this, just drop the roots in the in the pot. Now, to be honest with you, this pot's a bit small. But um, as uh, as they go in, um, you know, other people can pop these up later as they as they sort of grow in. Really. But uh, it'll it'll most certainly be okay in here for sort of six months or so. Now again, sort of turn it round and then put the soil and make sure it's all covered. Now what I'm going to do is just just sort of shuffle the plants up and down a little bit. And what that does is it allows the soil to drop through and round the roots. Push that in. Now we need a little bit more soil in there like that, just to make sure you come to the bottom of the plant, so as you can see there's the there's the base of the plant in there, so the soil level goes up to there. And then in exactly the same way, I'm just going to put a little bit of shale in, some in that side, some in that side, and that will help to anchor the plant in, to keep it, um, to keep it anchored, so that, you know, it's uh, obviously it's a little bit loose now, but um, that will uh, most certainly serve that plant well, and then that can be potted up potentially later this year, um, you know, as it grows. So I hope this episode has been of some use to you. Please don't hesitate to put any comments or questions you've got below and I'll always get back to you. And I'll see you on the next episode of Jim's Lot in the Garden.